Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis. I will be giving this training together with David Schlissel, the Institute's Director of Resource Planning Analysis. Uh, before we get started, I'm going to run through the logistics of the webinar. Uh, this webinar is scheduled for one hour. Um, it, is, it is going to be recorded, and the recording will be posted along with our PowerPoint presentation at www.ieefa.org slash training by next Monday, March 9th. Um, all of your lines have been muted. Um, if you have a question, uh, please type it into the chat box at the bottom right of your GoToMeeting screen. Um, we will go through and answer the questions uh, once we finish the presentation. Uh, okay, so I'm going to get started with the presentation now. Um, our goal in this webinar is to introduce you to some of the key concepts that you will hear at the Energy Finance 2015 conference in a couple weeks. Um, I'm going to start by giving kind of an overview of the structure of the electricity utility industry in the United States today, the different regional markets, um, the types of companies in the utility industry, um, and how investment decisions get made. Um, and then I'm going to turn it into, over to David, who's going to talk more about uh, power plant costs and how we evaluate uh, the economic and financial performance of power plants. So um, I want to get started with a little history. Um, in the 1920s, a uh, major utility holding company empires collapsed during the 1929 financial crisis. And in response, in 1935, Congress passed the Public Utility Holding Company Act, uh, which placed restrictions on utility operations. Um, it restricted affiliate transactions and, limited, oh, and it, limited, it limited utilities' abilities to acquire other utilities um, or to acquire non-utility businesses. So it restricted corporate structures and mergers. From 1935 until the early 1990s, electric utilities were all vertically integrated regulated companies. Um, this means that one company would own every aspect of the business, owning power plants, um, high voltage transmission lines, and the distribution lines that deliver power to homes and businesses. Such companies were regulated by state public service commissions, which were charged with ensuring that utilities uh, charge just and reasonable rates to customers that were set to recover the utility's cost of service and allow the utility to earn a profit. Um, this began to change with the deregulation of the electric utility industry in the 90s. Um, in states that deregulated, the vertically integrated utilities were split up so that the power generation, transmission, and distribution functions were owned by three different companies. The idea was that the generation companies would be forced to compete and sell their power on a market. The distribution companies would buy power from the market and distribute it to homes and businesses. And these entities would still be regulated by state public service commissions. Um, the public service commissions would no longer have any jurisdiction over the generation and transmission companies. Um, the California electricity crisis highlighted early problems with deregulation uh, as companies like Enron were able to speculate in the power markets and drive up the cost of power and ultimately cost consumers tens of billions of dollars. Um, this effectively put a freeze on electricity de deregulation around the country so that other states that had been moving towards deregulation decided not to. So as a result, today we have a, a, a patchwork of deregulated and regulated states. Um, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission played a role in supporting the transition to deregulation. Uh, FERC encouraged the formation of what are called Regional Transmission Organizations, RTOs, and Independent System Operators, ISOs. Um, there are slight technical differences between ISOs and RTOs, but they're basically the same thing. And these entities are supposed to ensure open access to the electricity grid uh, to facilitate competition. And over time, they have evolved into creating and managing wholesale markets for electricity. Uh, this map shows the existing uh, independent system operators and regional transmission organizations. Um, if we take a look at this map, it's clear that the southeast and most of the west are still largely regulated. Um, the deregulated states 
where we have the most well-developed markets are in the Mid-Atlantic, New England, and the Midwest, um, and also California and Texas. The Southeast is largely the domain of the Southern Company and Duke Energy, uh, which are two of the largest utilities in the country. Um, so there, there are two main types of wholesale electricity markets that the RTOs manage, energy markets and capacity markets. Um, Distribution, electric distribution companies need to procure both energy and capacity. Energy refers to the amount of electricity being generated at any given time, and capacity refers to the total amount of power plants on the system, uh, which you need to ensure you need to ensure that there's enough to meet peak demand. So I'm going to start talking about energy markets. Um, in an energy market, power plants bid into the market with their cost to generate power. Uh, the grid manager sorts all of these bids from the lowest to highest cost. Uh, it sees how much power is needed to meet consumer demand for electricity and dispatches the lowest cost plants first. Um, all of the plants receive the market clearing price for electricity, which is the price of the most expensive plant that is dispatched. So in this graph, um, if the de total demand on the system is 67 gigawatts, then all of the plants to the left of the 67 gigawatt line are dispatched and all of them receive the price of the most expensive plant, which is about maybe $40 per megawatt hour. Um, if the demand is much higher, 114 gigawatts, all of the plants to the left of that line are dispatched and they receive the market clearing price of $100 per megawatt hour. Um, in order to balance electricity generation with real-time electricity demand, there are typically multiple energy markets, including a day-ahead market where power is committed one day in advance, and also a minute-to-minute -minute or spot market where additional transactions occur to meet demand. Um, this graph shows uh, an example of electricity market prices in the PJ PJM day-ahead energy market for the past several years. PJM is the independent system operator, or RTO, for the Mid-Atlantic region. Um, so these are monthly average prices. Uh, the on-peak prices are prices uh, during the day, and off-peak are uh, nights and weekends when power demand is typically less. Um, so you can see uh, that at times of high power demand, more power plants that are more expensive to operate have to be brought online, and this drives up the market price for power. Uh, the big spike in the winter of 2014 corresponds uh, to the polar vortex, which was a time of uh, record power demand in PJM. Um, you can also see in this graph um, that power prices since 2008 have been on average lower than they were in the 2006 to 2008 time frame. Um, and this is generally true around the country and has been driven by uh, low natural gas prices, stagnating demand for electricity, and the growth in energy efficiency and renewable energy. So the other type of market that some uh, independent system operators operate is called a capacity market. Uh, the rationale for the capacity market is to ensure that there are enough power plants operating in the region to guarantee reliability. Uh, when, the, when the power industry was vertically integrated and regulated, this was simple to do. Um, state public service commissions simply required the utilities to maintain a reserve margin, that is to say, have 20% more power plant capacity on hand than they projected to need to meet demand, so that if one or two plants had unexpected outages, they would still be able to keep the lights on. Uh, with deregulated uh, electricity markets, this is more complicated because there's no way for state regulators to require that a certain amount of power plant capacity be built within their state. So one mechanism to deal with this uh, is the capacity market in which uh, power plant owners bid into the capacity market with how much uh, power plant capacity they are planning to have several years in advance. And the grid, the grid manager estimates how much capacity the region will need and procures enough to have a sufficient reserve. So in theory, a capacity market is supposed to provide a stable price signal so that investors will know when new generation is needed and how much that capacity will be worth several years in the future. Uh, in practice, it has generally not worked out this way. Prices have been very unstable, um, as shown by this graph of capacity market prices in PJM over the last several years. 
Um, and so, in fact, capacity markets have done more to provide revenue to existing generation than to incentivize new capacity development. Um, the regions of the country with capacity markets are New England, New York, the Midwest, and PJM in the Mid-Atlantic. So now I'm going to talk in more detail about uh, the different types of companies that are engaged in the electricity business. Um, I'm going to focus here on the privately owned companies. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the publicly owned entities later. Um, as I said earlier, because of the restructuring of the industry, uh, in some parts of the country, the traditional vertically integrated electricity business has been broken up into different types of companies. So the merchant generating companies own power plants which are not regulated, um, and they sell their power in the market and are completely dependent on market prices for their revenues. So uh, NRG and Dynagy are some of the largest merchant generating companies in the country. Uh, the transmission companies own and build transmission lines. They are regulated by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Uh, an example is the PATH transmission line uh, that was proposed through West Virginia. Um, distribution companies uh, own the distribution system and deliver power to customers. And they are still regulated by state public service commissions. And examples include PEPCO in uh, parts of the Mid-Atlantic and National Grid in New England. Um, but some regions of the country still have vertically integrated companies that perform all three of the functions of power generation, transmission, and distribution. Um, examples include Alabama Power, which is a subsidiary of the Southern Company, uh, Northwestern Energy in Montana. Um, so the interesting thing about this is that even though the point of deregulation was to separate out the different functions within the electricity industry, there's nothing to stop one company from owning all these different types of companies under one holding company structure. So a utility holding company will own different combinations of the above four types of companies. Um, and there's no overarching regulator of a holding company, even though the different subsidiary pieces may be regulated by different entities. Um, so some examples of holding companies uh, include the Southern Company, which owns several vertically integrated companies, uh, and also in Southern Power, a merchant generation company. Uh, the Exelon Corporation owns merchant generation, transmission, and distribution companies. Um, and then American Electric Power and First Energy own generation, transmission, distribution, as well as uh, vertically integrated utilities. So it's more common than not for a major company in the electricity business to have subsidiaries that fall into the different categories. Um, and this is a relatively new phenomenon. Um, it's a result of deregulation, and it's also a result of the repeal of the Public Utility Holding Company Act in 2005. Uh, that act had placed limits on utility holding company structures and restricted the types of mergers between utilities that could take place, um, that no such, no such restrictions currently exist. Um, so I want to talk now about um, the implications of these different regulatory frameworks for investment in power plants. Um, there are several types of power plant owners. There are the merchant generation companies, um, which own unregulated power plants. There are the vertically integrated companies that own power plants. And then there are also different types of publicly owned power systems, including uh, electric membership cooperatives and federal power agencies like the Tennessee Valley Authority. Uh, these entities all have different incentives for whether to invest in a project um, as well as different risks. So merchant generation companies, um, in order to build a new power plant, they need to think that they will get enough revenue from energy and capacity markets to cover the costs of the plant. So if the outlook for future prices is low, um, as it is currently, you will generally not see these companies proposing to make major investments in capital-intensive forms of generation. Um, instead, we are seeing these com companies currently interested in investing in natural gas because it is less ca capital-intensive and because natural gas prices are currently low and projected to remain so. Um, vertically integrated companies are still regulated. Um, if they want to build a new power plant, 
or invest in pollution control equipment at an existing power plant, they need permission from their state's public service commission. And if permission is granted, they will be able to recover the cost of their investment from ratepayers plus a rate of return. So in a way, these companies have almost the opposite incentive. Um, they have an incentive to build as much as possible because they can earn a percentage return on what they spend. Um, so it's more likely that you'd see proposals for expensive nuclear power plants or coal plants uh, showing up in regulated states. Um, public entities uh, can also own power plants. Um, typically, these entities pay, pay for power plants by taking on debt, and their rates usually go to cover the debt service on their existing power plants. Um, so cost of debt is a major factor driving investment. Um, typically, a lot of uh, public entities and rural electric co-ops have historically been very committed to coal, um, and that's also you know, a factor uh, in their future investments. Um, so the next couple of slides here just show an example of the incentives for uh, vertically integrated regulated, regulated companies. Uh, the Merrimack plant is a, a plant owned by a regulated utility in New Hampshire. Um, and before uh, a scrubber was put on the Merrimack plant, the investment in the plant was about $100 million. Adding the scrubber uh, added another $400 million of investment. Um, but since the plant was regulated, this also meant that the return on that investment or the profit for the owner went from a little bit more than $10 million uh, to more than $50 million with the scrubber. So um, I, also, I want to conclude by talking about how uh, these financial incentives and different uh, corporate structures drive corporate policy. Um, so merchant generation companies are interested in driving up wholesale electricity market prices um, to benefit their own generation. Uh, this means that they often try to advocate within the independent system operators for rule changes that would drive up the price of power, for example, by limiting, limiting how other uh, types of generation can participate in the markets. Um, they also have incentives to try to block competition, so uh, such companies are often opponents to subsidies for wind and other forms of renewable generation. Um, vertically integrated companies have an incentive to uh, increase sales um, so, that they're, so that they are earning more money through rate. Um, and as a result, they have an incentive to oppose energy efficiency and customer-owned power generation, uh, which tend to reduce their sales. Um, so you'll note that both the merchant generation companies and the vertically integrated companies uh, have an, in, an interest in opposing energy efficiency and rooftop solar. And in recent years, the utility industry has really gone on the attack in trying to roll back uh, solar policies and, and energy efficiency policies in many states. Um, in the last several years, we've also seen a shift in the utility industry uh, back towards investment in regulated states. Um, it, it's become apparent that the unregulated merchant generation companies are facing a much more volatile and riskier business environment than the traditional regulated utility whose power plants are all but guaranteed to recover their costs through electric rates established by public service commissions. In contrast, the merchant generation companies um, are much more exposed to changes in the price of coal or natural gas um, that affect the profitability, profitability of their plants. So as a result, a lot of holding companies that own merchant generation companies have been trying to get out of the merchant business and into more regulated uh, businesses. So we've seen these holding companies trying to do this by acquiring more regulated distribution companies, by selling their merchant generation businesses, and by transferring power plants um, from merchant generation subsidiaries to regulated subsidiaries. Um, so that this concludes kind of my overview of the large structure of the industry and utility trends. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to David for the rest of the presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk about the components of power plant costs, the metrics we use to evaluate power plant performance, 
and some suggestions for where you can find data about your favorite power plant or uh, company. Here we go, sorry. Bit of a time delay on the uh, slides here. Uh, the capital cost is the cost of building a power plant. And it's also the cost of making periodic equipment replacements, major repairs, and or plant upgrades. I'd mention as an aside, uh, routine maintenance is expensed, which means it's just spent in, in the, the cost is recovered in a year. Uh, major repairs, equipment repl uh, replacements are capitalized. Uh, capital costs include labor cost, cost of materials, cost of equipment. If you're going to replace equipment or build a new power plant that has lots of pieces of equipment, it includes commodities like uh, steel, concrete, piping, wire, etc. The costs of financing these capital expenditures are included in the annual costs of generating power. For investor-owned companies, these financing costs are a blend of shareholder-provided funds, called equity, and borrowed money, called debt. For publicly owned utilities and electric membership co-ops, the financing costs are debt. The general rule is the more it costs to build a power plant or to make an, an upgrade, the higher the annual financing costs will be depending on the equity and debt borrowing rates. Uh, I should mention here that when I prepared the slide, I forgot to also include annual depreciation costs. So that if a power plant costs a billion dollars and expect it to have a life of 25 years, each year the owner will recover $40 million, one twenty-fifth of the billion, uh, in depreciation cost. Although it's, the accounting and the tax ramifications make the more complicated. That's a simplistic way to look at it. Other components of power, power plant costs include ongoing operating maintenance, O&M costs, labor, materials, etc., fuel costs for fossil and nuclear power plants, and cost of transmitting power from where it is generated to places where it is used. You'll hear when, when people talk about uh, power plant operating costs, they talk about fixed versus variable power plant operating costs. Simply, fixed costs are those costs that have to be paid each year whether or not the power plant generates any power or how much it generates. These are the financing costs. These, it's the annual depreciation I mentioned. <coughs> Excuse me. And almost all operating and maintenance costs are fixed. Again, they have to be paid whether or not a plant generates any power whatsoever. Other costs, like fuel and some of the O&M costs, are variable. These fluctuate, change, depending on how many megawatt hours are generated. Examples of variable O&M costs uh, will include the cost of operating plant environmental control equipment. The more power, the, the more energy the plant generates during the year, the more crud they have to take away, and the higher the variable operating cost. Uh, this is a slide, an example of a rising power plant construction costs. Uh, basically, we could look at any power plant, uh, any fossil or nuclear power plant that was built in the U.S. since uh, 2000, and it would have the same increases in costs uh, over the years. The numbers may be different, the specific costs, but the theme is the same. Costs have been going up. The Kemper IGCC coal plant in Mississippi. IGCC refers to integrated gasification combined cycle. What that means is coal actually in Kemper's, uh, with, at Kemper it's lignite, uh, basically close to dirt, is gasified, 
It's then burned, the gas is then burned as it would be in a combined cycle gas plant. Uh, in, as you can see on the, the first uh, bar, when the company obtained its uh, permit to build the plant, they said the cost was going to cost $2.92 billion for the entire plant. Uh, the most recent cost estimate earlier this month is $6.15 billion, so the cost has more than doubled. The plant's not due to be completed for another year, so we expect further significant increases. Uh, back in 2009, I filed testimony saying that the $2.92 billion cost was too low, that they should allow for the fact that the cost could go up by 20% or 40%. Uh, clearly, my number was too low, but even if the company's proposed $2.92 billion cost, the project was uneconomic, uh, but the company went ahead and built it anyway. Uh, the next slide shows you kind of relative costs among the different supply side and demand side resources. Building new nuclear plants, Coal plants, IGCC plants, as I just mentioned, uh, they have high to very high initial capital costs, construction costs. Uh, they have moderate to high non-fuel operating costs. Uh, nuclear fuel cost is very low. Coal costs are low to moderate. Natural gas costs will fluctuate low to moderate to high depending on where and when you look at them. Uh, and for each of these power plants, the, the central power plants are called nuclear coal, natural gas, and IGCC, uh, they need transmission to get from the power plant side to where the customers are. The renewable resources, wind, and distributed solar also have high initial capital costs, but their capital costs are declining uh, in distributed solar's case very rapidly. Wind and distributed solar PV also have low non-fuel operating costs. They have no fuel costs. While wind doesn't need a transmission cost, Distributed solar doesn't because it can be on people's houses, commercial buildings, uh, and be plugged into, right into the place where the electricity is going to be used. Uh, energy, effici oops, sorry. energy efficiency uh, has the lowest cost, has no ongoing O&M costs, has no fuel costs, and doesn't include transmission, doesn't need a transmission cost. On an economic basis, energy efficiency is the hands-down winner. On a political basis, it's not because it poses a threat to the existing uh, companies that Kathy mentioned. Uh, the investor-owned utilities, uh, the publicly-owned systems are hesitant to do it because it would mean uh, lost customers and lower revenues, and it's a threat, of course, to the fossil fuel industry as well. Here is an example of monthly costs from the pa Prairie State Energy Campus, one of the power plants that uh, we at uh, the Institute have been involved with uh, for the past uh, three, four years, maybe longer. Uh, and you can uh, what I've done is I've disaggregated the total monthly cost, and this is to one of the customers, uh, Paducah, Kentucky, that buys power from the plant. Uh, the blue are the transmission-related costs. The orange are the annual fixed costs, financing costs, and depreciation. And the green are the ongoing operating and maintenance costs. Whoops, sorry about that. You can see that the financing costs in many months are a huge portion of the, the total cost of power from the plant. Uh, that's because the less 
power it generates in any month or year, the fixed costs are spread over fewer megawatt hours. With regards to Prairie State, the fixed costs during the plant's first uh, couple of years of operation have averaged about 56 to 60 percent of its total cost. So the very high costs of construction I showed before with Kemper as an example will mean high cost, high power costs in the plant as well. Power plant metrics, capacity and energy. Kathy went into this briefly. I'm going to go in a little more detail. Capacity is a measure of the power that a plant can produce at any one moment or instance. It's measured in megawatts, which are thousands of, sorry, megawatts, which are millions of watts. They're thousands of kilowatts. Large fossil and nuclear power plants have full power ratings, generally in the range of 250 megawatts to 1,500 megawatts, with the higher end of the range being the nuclear. Uh, coal units are generally 250 to 800 megawatts each. A large fossil-fired power plant will generally have several units at the same site. So you may see a 1,600 megawatt coal plant that has two 800 megawatt units like Prairie State, or you may see a 1,500 megawatt uh, coal plant that has seven or eight smaller units at a site. While capacity is the measure of the power a plant issues at any, generates at any one time, energy is a measure of how much power it generates over time, whether you're looking at hours, days, months, or years. Energy is measured in megawatt hours. Again, that's a megawatt hour is a thousand kilowatt hours. When you pay your electric bill, it's in kilowatt hours. But when you're talking about power plants, it's generally considered to be more convenient to talk about megawatt hours. Oops. Uh, for, as an example, a hundred megawatt power plant that generates at full power for ten hours will produce a thousand megawatt hours. The next uh, metric that we use, and when I say we, it's, these are all commonly used in the electric utility industry. A power plant's capacity factor is a measure of how much energy, again in megawatt hours, it generates during the period of time being examined, whether that's a month, several months, a year, or several years. Capacity factor is given as a percentage. The plant's actual generation in megawatt hours in the period is divided by the amount of power it would have generated if it had operated at full power for all hours. As an example, a power plant with a full power rating of 100 megawatts operates at only 50 megawatts for all of the hours of the period. Therefore, its capacity factor is 50 percent. The amount of power generated by a plant will change perhaps frequently during a period in response to outages, equipment problems, or economics factors such as lower demand, or if it's in a competitive market, whether there are cheaper plants being offered and being bid into the market. The higher the capacity factor, the better, because you're spreading the fixed costs, those annual depreciation costs and financing costs that I mentioned before, over more megawatt hours, so the cost per megawatt hour is lower. Now, one mistake people frequently make, and I've been doing this for more than 40 years and sometimes I stumble, is the difference between capacity and capacity factor. Capacity factor is how much power a plant can generate at any one instance. If you're talking about a large coal unit, perhaps it's 800 megawatts. Capacity factor is a measure of how much energy the plant produces over a period of time. So you have to be clear in your head which you're trying to talk about. Uh, this is a tale of two power plants at the same site. Uh, you can see that the blue line is uh, for a natural gas combined cycle plant at the Barry site in southern Alabama. Uh, over time, the plant has generated more and more power uh, due in large part to the fact that in 2008, natural gas prices collapsed, 
making it more economic to continue to operate the uh, combined cycle unit more. The black line is the declining, generally declining generation from the coal unit, the most efficient coal unit at the same site. As natural gas prices go down, the gas plant displaces the coal plant. It's more complicated because they're both tied into a, a, the large southern company system, but this kind of gives you a uh, visual as to how natural gas units have displaced coal generation. The last metric I'm going to talk about for individual power plants is the heat rate. A power plant's heat rate measures how efficiently the, per the plant burns fuel. The more efficiently the plant burns fuel, the less fuel it needs to generate a megawatt hour or kilowatt hour of energy, and consequently the lower its fuel cost. Heat rate is measured in Brit British thermal units per kilowatt hour of electricity generated. You'll see it as BTU per kilowatt hour or BTU slash KWH. The lower the heat rate, the better. This means, with a lower heat rate, it means that the plant requires less energy input from the fuel to produce an average kilowatt hour of electricity. So with capacity factor, the higher the better. With heat rate, the lower the better. These are some illustrative power plant heat rates. Uh, I wanted to give you a sense of the difference between the various uh, types of uh, fossil-fired power plants. Uh, any individual plant's heat rate will vary during the day, depending on whether it's full load, half load. Uh, so it will change over time. But these numbers are, are roughly correct ballpark. New coal plants and new supercritical plants uh, that have been built most recently, Prairie State uh, and, and some others, have a 9,000 BTU per kilowatt hour heat rate, relatively efficient, more efficient than the older coal plants, which are in the range of 10,000 to 12, 13,000 BTU per kWh. Uh, new coal plants are less efficient than new natural gas-fired combined cycle plants, which have about 7,000 uh, heat rates of about 7,000 per BTU. K, uh, K, BT, 7,000 BTU per kWh. And then natural gas-fired combustion turbines are even more inefficient. That's why you only use uh, the combustion turbines for limited periods, peak hour periods, uh, so they run for limited, they produce limited generation. Another metric that, that's used for an electric utility system or for a region uh, is the fuel or generation mix. I've given an example of New England in, in 2013. This is the New England, it's called ISO New England. Uh, their system in 20, this is by energy, so it's by megawatt hours generated by the plants using each of these different uh, fuels. You can see that gas was, was Gas-fired facilities generated 45.6% of the energy in ISO New England uh, in 2013, coal 5.6%, nuclear roughly a third of the energy generated. Uh, if we went back to the year 2000, the gas and the coal would be reversed to a large extent. Uh, gas uh, represented somewhere in the range of 14% of the energy generated in uh, ISO New England in 2020, 20, 2000, and you can see it's grown dramatically. Uh, coal has shrunk uh, pretty much just as dramatically. Uh, solar is still pathetically small. Wind is unfortunately low. Oil's also been displaced by natural gas, and it, it, it's lower, uh, as well as uh, major a major impact from uh, energy efficiency. Oops. 
So now that you've learned all this stuff, you can go home or maybe you're at home and you can, you can do this on your own. Uh, where can you find information about power plant operations and costs? These are some thoughts we've had. Investor-owned companies, both regulated utilities and merchant companies, each year file 10, they're called 10K filings to the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. They're available either on the SEC website through something called EDGAR, E-D-G-A-R, or on the company websites. Uh, there are annual 8K filings, but uh, the 10K contains a lot of information, financial information about the company, as well as information about uh, the, the power plants it, it owns. Uh, regulated investor-owned utilities also file what are called Form 1 e each year to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC, and to state utility commissions. They contain a wide range of data. Pa plant owners and com companies uh, file data with the U.S. Energy Information Administration, EIA, of the Department of Energy. We suggest you look at Forms 860, 861, and 923. <coughs> For public power utilities and electric membership cooperatives, uh, they don't have the same filing requirements. Uh, the sources, uh, I say partially tongue-in-cheek, ask them nicely. Uh, that may not work. Better find a friendly board ma member to, to ask for the information you want. Uh, in our work around Prairie State, uh, basically we have some friendly board members of the, on the, in the towns that buy power who have been able to get information, or you have to file Freedom of Information Act requests, FOIA requests. The last source, or next to last source, sorry, uh, the EPA has a SEMS database. It's on their website. Uh, you can get information about emissions from the plant, the heat input, and you can figure out its generation hour by hour or over or or uh, during selected periods of time. Uh, the last sources I would suggest are, you can ask us uh, for information, we can help you find it. Or uh, my old colleagues at Synapse Energy Economics have a, a database and uh, if they're not overwhelmed, I'm sure we'd probably be amenable to helping people. And that that is it. If you have questions, uh, please contact Kathy or me uh, at the email addresses you can see. And, and if you have questions now, we can take um, some questions if you want to type them into the chat box um, in the uh, right bottom right of your GoToMeeting uh, toolbar. So we'll wait a couple minutes and see uh, if folks have questions here. So Lori asks, uh, where does nuclear figure into all of this? Uh, David, do you want to take that? Well. Nuclear figures in several places. Uh, the old nuclear power plants, the, the existing ones, uh, are relatively cheap to operate uh, and uh, by and large have 60-year operating licenses now and they're thinking about extending them to 80, uh, 80 years. Uh, they're they're, as I say, they're generally they're older, they're mostly depreciated out their cost. Uh, the new plants are very expensive. You're talking upwards of above $10,000 per kilowatt. When you talk about the cost of a, of a power plant, a uh, common industry way of talking about it is how much it costs per kilowatt of capacity. 
So uh, the new nuclear plants are, I don't know, 10,000 per kW uh, or even higher, the new cost, and they're very expensive, much more expensive than energy efficiency. Uh, but the industry, to give them their due, the nuclear industry has gotten their act together and, and has learned how to operate their power plants. Uh, 20, 25 years ago, they didn't do such a good job of operating their power plants, and the plants had 60, 65 percent capacity factors, which made them very uneconomic for ratepayers. Because again, you're taking these really big fixed costs, depreciation and financing costs, and uh, charging them over a relatively small number of megawatt hours. In the late 80s, going into the 90s, the industry learned how to operate its, its nukes. And now you'll talk about nukes with capacity factors on the order of 90 to 95 percent each year. Uh, despite that, there are eight nuclear plants in the Midwest that are supposedly on terminal because they're uneconomic to operate because the price of power, as, as uh, Kathy showed, is expected to be so low that the companies can't make a profit or enough of a profit for themselves. I don't know if there's anything else in specific you you want to know, but that's generally it. If you do, you can contact me by email. Okay, so we've got um, about four more questions that have come in, so um, I'll try to go through these now. Uh, the first one is, how would the different organizations, the merchant plants, regulated transmission companies, and vertically in integrated companies be motivated to change if fuel costs change due to a price on carbon dioxide emissions? Um, and I think, I mean, I can, uh, I can answer some of that, and David, you can chime in. Um, I mean, a price on carbon dioxide emissions would be particularly a uh, disadvantage for uh, existing owners of existing coal plants um, and so I think we would see uh, certainly the regulated companies just trying to pass on whatever costs for additional uh, upgrades to coal plants or costs of retiring coal plants onto their customers and I think you would see in the merchant generating space um, uh, an accelerated uh, attempt to either get to get rid of the merchant coal plants and also to switch to, to gas. Um, is there anything you want to add to that, David? Uh, yes. Uh, the owners of existing nukes would be beside themselves with joy. Okay. They'd make a lot of money because the market price of power would be set higher because of the price that uh, fossil plants would have to pay for uh, carbon dioxide emission allowances. Uh, renewables would love it. Uh, merchant companies would hate it because the way they make profit is their profit is dependent on the difference between the cost at which they generate power and the cost at which they can sell it. If the cost of an emissions allowance credit allowance uh, causes their cost of producing the power to go up. If they can't recover it through the market, they're, they're dead meat, or that plant is dead meat, uh, to use a technical term. Uh, and uh, with regard to regulated companies, they'd probably dance because they would be able to pass along emission allowance costs to their customers and they would then go out and build expensive new plants that didn't admit as much. And as Kathy showed, they would then put those into rate base. And since they're allowed to earn a, re a return, a profit, directly proportional to how much they've invested in plant, that would just, they'd make more money. OK. Um. So on to the next question, which is asking when the slides will be available. So uh, this recorded webinar, as well as the presentations, will be available on our website at www.ieefa.org training um, by next Monday, March 9th. 
Um, the next question is, um, in your first few slides, what did you mean by dispatch? And do the vertically integrated companies have a guaranteed return on investment when they create a new power plant or take on other costs? Um, so to answer the first part of that, um, in, in areas of the country where there are uh, markets for electricity, uh, the grid operator who manages the markets, like PJM in the Mid-Atlantic, uh, controls which power plants run at which time based on their costs. And so uh, the term dispatch refers to the grid operator telling a power plant uh, when to run, basically. Um, and then the second part of the question is, do the vertically integrated companies have a guaranteed return on investment when they create a new power plant? So uh, they have to seek permission from the State Public Service Commission um, in order to build a new power plant. And once permission is granted, um, they will typically be able to uh, recover the cost of that investment plus the rate of return. Um, there are some cases where the cost of building the plant has been so dramatically in excess of what the company originally predicted that the Public Service Commission <coughs> has prevented them, prevented the utility from recovering all of the costs, but uh, that is, I think, more the exception than the rule. Um, Companies you know, are allowed to recover the prudent costs they spent. So right. as Kathy mentioned, in, in a number of cases, particularly with new nuclear power plants back in the 80s and 90s, we were able to demonstrate that the costs were not not prudently incurred uh, or were unnecessary and uh, prevented the utility from passing those along. With regards to the Kemper IGCC plant I mentioned, they have a cap of about, on some of the costs, of $2.8 billion, uh, and Southern Company is going to eat or about $3 billion of the cost of that plant itself, because they won't be able to pass it all on to uh, their rate payers. Um, so the, the next question here for us um, is, are there books you might recommend for the layperson who wants to learn more about energy generation and power markets? Um, David, <laughs> do you have any books you would recommend? Well, actually, the, the book I would recommend uh, follows, the, tells the story that Kathy began the webinar with, the history. It's called Insull, I-N-S-U-L-L. -L. It's about Samuel Insull, who developed the utility structure uh, Kathy mentioned the Public Utility Holding Company Act of, what was it, 35, 1935. And it was, that act was basically to outlaw all of the holding companies that Samuel Insull had developed. He was a competitor to uh, Thomas Edison in terms of developing the power plants, not as an inventor. Uh, and it's a fascinating book, a fascinating story. Uh, in yeah. terms of of books on, on how on power plant operating, uh, I would just I, I, I don't have any in mind. I'd suggest you, you look at them. In terms of the regulation of utilities, uh, the, the, the godfather of, in a good way, of the uh, regulation uh, was a guy named Bonbright, B-O-N-B-R-I-G-H-T. If you Google his name, you'll find uh, his texts. And they're widely used and widely quoted uh, when people are trying to learn about the electric utility and regulation. Uh, but again, for, in, in, for how power plants operate, I'd suggest just Googling, Googling and uh, seeing what you can find. And if you have trouble with it, contact uh, Kathy or me, and we'll try yeah. to help you. And I just typed this into the, the chat box, too, the recommendations that you just made. Um, the next question is, best examples of where ratepayers or lay public groups were able to use this type of information to make a difference uh, to, to 
uh, outcomes. Um, well, there are, there are lots of examples. Uh, over the years, there have been many victories by environmental groups and consumer advocate groups. Uh, it's hard to cite the best. Uh, 150 proposed coal plants uh, were canceled. Uh, a significant factor leading to that was citizen opposition. Uh, utilities haven't been able to pass along rate uh, the costs of new plants, the new nuclear plants, and imprudent costs of other types of plants due to uh, citizen environmental and ratepayer opposition. Uh, so there's a long and healthy uh, experience. If you want to email me, I'll give you some examples of, of some victories uh, we and I don't uh, those of us involved in the Institute have been in, involved with, uh, I don't want to spend time tooting our own horn here. So um, we're coming up on 5 o'clock here. Um, and, but I think, uh, David, if you're willing, there are several more questions in the queue. So um, I think we could stay on for another 15 minutes to try to answer them if, you, if you're available. I'm game unless somebody comes to throw me out of the conference room I'm in. Okay. Um, so the next question uh, for you, David, is in your slide of components of power plant costs, um, why isn't one of the costs lost revenue? Uh, because uh, lost revenue is a cost to the plant owner uh, and it's generally factored in when they come in complaining about energy efficiency and renewables. Right. Uh, so it's a it's a way for it's making not, the it's utility not, company it's whole plant, to its uh, sales. Yeah. Power plant sorry. Cost. Yeah. It's a it's a cost due to the utilities a drop in sales due to efficiency and rooftop solar. It's not specifically a cost that's attributed to a particular power plant. Right. Um, so the next, the next question is, what are the best policy remedies to counter the resistance from utilities to rooftop solar and energy efficiency based on their, their business model? This is the easiest question we're going to get. Come to Energy Finance 2015 and go to the workshop that has Carl Rabigo on the panel. Uh, Carl is an expert on solar pricing and will be talking about the very question you raise. Um, the next question is, how did JP Morgan, et cetera, manipulate the markets in California to make money on dying coal plants? And they, could they be doing it elsewhere? Um, I can take a quick stab at this. Um, in the question of could they be doing it elsewhere, um, there are periodically various prosecutions of J.P. Morgan and other financial traders for speculating in, pol in power markets. Um, I think there was recently uh, a case where they were fined for some speculation in the PJM market. So yes, so they're certainly doing it elsewhere, although not to date on the same scale that they did in California. Um, in California, there were, there's a really good book, actually I should have mentioned earlier, called Power Play. Um, I'll put it in the chat box, but it documents what happened in California fairly well. Um, and I mean, I think a lot of it was creating kind of artificial scarcity in power of uh, buying up buying up power and then uh, not selling it. But Maybe I don't know the California electricity crisis that well. Maybe David can explain better. Yeah, I actually did a study for the city of San Francisco back in 2002 or three. The two big things, or two of the big things that were done were, one, power plants were arbitrarily taken offline to create the scarcity uh, that Kathy mentioned, which pushed up power prices. Also. Uh, I think Enron, in particular, uh, they were selling power out of state and then 
buying it back from the other state at a higher price. So there were all kinds of uh, gimmicks going on uh, to create the problem. They did have higher uh, loads on the system than they expected, but it, a large part of it was uh, manipulation of the power markets. And could it be happening again? Uh, yes. I don't have evidence that it is, but could it be? Sure. Um, and then the last question here for us is, will Energy Finance 2015 conference sessions also be made available uh, after the fact? Um, and I think the answer is that the PowerPoint presentations will be made available, but not, the sessions themselves are not being recorded. Um, that is, correct. is that correct, Dave? That's correct. OK. Um, well, great. So it's a little bit after 5, um, and so we are going to wrap up this webinar now. Um, thank you, all of you, for joining. Um, feel, feel free to email myself or David with any further questions that you might have, and uh, we look forward to meeting some of you at Energy Finance 2015.